Oh, friends, welcome to Science Talk. I am your host, Jim Massa. Okay, what we see here, this appeared in the online publication EOS. Rivers in the sky are hindering winter Arctic sea ice recovery. Climate change is increasing the frequency of moisture dumping atmospheric rivers in the Arctic. The storms are pushing back sea ice at a time of year when it should be expanding. And here's a uh, photo taken March 21 of 2021 showing the Arctic sea ice at its maximum extent in 2021 is declining in part because more atmospheric rivers are melting the ice. And you notice know, to orientate yourself, uh, Greenland, Baffin Bay, right? Uh, Alaska, Russia, Bering Strait. So you know, East Siberian Sea, Chukchi Sea, Beaufort Sea, right? And this is at its ex maximum extent because remember in the Northern Hemisphere, March is the oceanic winter. So this is when you would expect to see the maximum extent of sea ice. Now, in the past, the sea ice would actually extend further out into the Bering Sea. And I don't know if you can see it on this diagram, but you see this shade of blue and this shade looks a little darker. It's because this is part of that, uh, that shelf system here. It's about 50 or so meters deep. And then it gets deeper, and you can see the Aleutian arc uh, that way. But uh, you get a lot of, uh, you know, transport of materials up onto the shelf, along with the fact that there is a, uh, a divergent, there's a, uh, a counterclockwise gyro creating an upwelling in the middle of, of this uh, area that helps bring in nutrients, which helps make that region very productive. Anyway, I digress. Atmosphere rivers are reaching farther north with greater frequency than they were four decades ago, according to new research. These highways of uh, vapor, water vapor are dumping rain on recovering Arctic sea ice during the winter when ice should be at its peak. At any given time, multiple atmospheric rivers are moving more than a Mississippi River's worth of water from the equator to higher latitudes. That is a lot of moisture. When researchers first described the phenomenon uh, several decades ago, it was seen as a mid-latitude event associated with flooding in California, snowmelt in the Pacific Northwest. And we all know that uh, you know, California has been in the news a lot recently because they are just getting pummeled with one atmospheric river after the other, just slamming into California, dumping huge amounts of rain. And, you know, it's just causing major messes all over the place, though the reservoirs are filling up a bit. But, you know, we're still we're seeing mudslides and you know, just, you know, pretty bad effects going on. But recently, atmospheric rivers have been snaking their way to the poles as well. A new study definitively links these extreme weather events with broader trend in Arctic sea ice loss. Well, part of that is going to be that uh, Eastern Pacific Oscillation that I just recently discussed with you. Um, you know, how this uh, switches between a positive and negative phase. And this is associated with how the jet stream behaves. Right? In one particular setup, the jet stream will flow more uh, latitudinally. And such atmospheric rivers do not make it to the poles. But another situation where the jet stream becomes more meridional, which is becoming more and more the case, then you this allows movement into the Arctic. You may want to check out that video if you have not done so already. 
So Peng's, Peng Fei Zong, an atmospheric scientist at Pennsylvania State University, began studying uh, Arctic atmospheric rivers two years ago when he noticed an interesting trend. Whenever an atmospheric river stretched far enough north to reach the Arctic, sea ice immediately retreated. The effect was most pronounced in the dark months of winter when Arctic sea ice was supposed to be recovering from summer losses to reach its maximum extent around late February or March. This means that the sea ice cover isn't able to extend to the maximum amount allowed by freezing temperatures, Zong said. Looking at satellite observations, meteorological data sets back to 79, Zong and his colleagues found that the number of atmospheric rivers that reached the Arctic had increased. At the same time, peak winter sea ice extent decreased. Okay. And of course, that ties into what I just said about jet stream becoming more and more meridional versus latitudinal. Atmospheric rivers contribute to sea ice melting in a few key ways. The water vapor they contain traps more heat than dry polar air does. Well, if it's water, that means it's above freezing, which means you know it's containing sensible heat. And then when that sensible heat, when the precipitation falls and contacts the ice, well, it's going to do some melting. As I said, this heat radiates down to the ice below. Heat is also released when water vapor forms rain or snow droplets. Finally, when rain reaches the surface, it melts the ice on contact, right? I just mentioned that. The impact was pronounced enough that the ice's retreat can be seen on satellite imagery within a few days of an atmospheric river storm. When atmospheric rivers become more frequent, the number of setbacks per season increases as well. Using a combination of historic uh, satellite data and climate modeling, the team determined that about a third of recent sea ice decline in parts of the Arctic could be attributed to the dampening effect that increasingly common atmospheric rivers have on sea ice recovery. The impact was most pronounced in areas with the highest number of atmospheric rivers, including the Barents and Kara Seas. Okay. That's over towards the Atlantic side of things. Because of the storms, when the Arctic warms in spring and summer, there is less sea ice to melt and a dark ocean surface is exposed faster. These waters absorb more sunlight, which drives faster warming, even more melting. Do not forget the importance of the role of incoming oceanic water through Fram and through the Bering Strait. These are warmer waters. They're bringing in the heat. They're melting the ice from below. They're delaying the, the freeze up you know, to later in the year. And they are contributing to the earlier melting of the sea ice. Do not neglect that. That is also a very important mechanism. And I had discussed this with you numerous, numerous times before. So it, you know, the, the atmospheric rivers Sounds like they are a, an important contributor, but do not discount the warm oceanic waters flowing into the Arctic Ocean. So using uh, Lens 2 uh, modeling, which is a Community Earth System Model, or CESM, they determined that 68% of the increasing trend in atmospheric river frequency could be a attributed to human-caused climate change. Though natural climate variability, like the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, also played a role, right? And that ties in with what the jet stream is doing, where the high and the low pressure systems are, and so on. And you could also include in that uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, even the Arctic Oscillation, and the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's, everything is tied together, folks. Everything is tied together. So Jonathan Will, uh, a polar meteorologist at ATH Zurich, uh, praised the work, saying, calling it impressive. He said they did an excellent job of quantifying the negative impacts of atmospheric rivers on early season sea ice growth. 
So this will mean that the Arctic is going to be wetter and warmer. And I, I, I published a video some time ago uh, discussing how models are indicating that by 2100, snow will be a thing of the past in the Arctic. It just won't happen. A wetter and warmer Arctic will have far-reaching consequences. Increasingly, frequent atmospheric rivers will make the Arctic a stormier place with bigger waves that could further uh, hinder ice formation. Well, if you don't have the sea ice there and you get uh, strong winds there, it's going to you know, whip up the, the ocean. And uh, yeah, you're going to have storm waves slamming uh, coastal uh, areas. We're seeing this already in western Alaska. This more extreme environment could have a number of impacts on Arctic ecosystems. More sunlight hitting open ocean as a result of less sea ice is already causing phytoplankton blooms to begin earlier and end later with impacts cascading across the food web. Well, that might be a good thing, but depends what type of phytoplankton blooms are happening. Now, I have argued in the past that, you know, you... With the loss of sea ice, you're going to lose the uh, uh, ice edge productivity that happens. And uh, when the, until the sun gets to a high enough uh, altitude in the sky to activate the you know, electron transport system of, of diatoms, you know, it's, there's still going to be a delay in that productivity. Not to mention the loss of productivity from the underside of uh, ice algae. So we might be seeing different types of phytoplankton blooming, probably maybe it's coccolithophorids, but okay, so if you're having earlier blooms and going later, that sounds like a good thing. You know, you're having productivity. But what we need to do, and I need, and we need to see what these studies quantify is, what is the biomass? What is the productivity of these blooms and for that period is does it compensate for the loss of diatom productivity ice edge productivity al sea algae uh, productivity ice algae productivity does it compensate for that is it less is it more that needs to be assessed so if it does at least compensate e uh, equals it or even greater then that then that's a good thing if not, well, uh, then you're going to have an overall net decrease in productivity. So we need to look and see what the net differences are. And does this equate to an overall net increase in productivity, primary, secondary, tertiary, or not? So um, that needs to be seen. And I'm uh, actually trying to, uh, and I'm doing a little research into this to see what studies are finding. On a global scale, sea ice retreat could slow the conveyor, the ocean conveyor belt, right, the AMOC, which could lead to droughts or sea level rise thousands of kilometers from uh, the Arctic. So, um, you know, if you have uh, open waters, they're going to absorb more sunlight uh, energy, and that's, you know, the taking into account specific heat of water that's going to linger longer. It's going to, then you have the latent heat release. So that's creating milder conditions in the Arctic. For example, if you here in Alaska, if you look at what month has warmed the most compared to historical record, it's October. I mean, June, July, yeah, the sun's up 24 hours a day. So it's not going to see that much increased temperatures. But October has warmed the most, and that's because the sea ice is, is not forming yet. So you have open water, and it's releasing all that heat. And as a result, we get things like freezing rain event, which is treacherous to drive on. And that's one thing I've noticed in all my years up here, is that winters in Alaska have gotten really crazy, especially interior Alaska. Is, you know, uh, interior Alaska used to be uh, classified as semi-arid. And the snow that we would get would typically be in, you know, September, October. You get a pile of snow. Not much happens until March. 
but the snow would be very, very dry and be no wind. So he gets very dry snow. That's all nice and dandy, easily removed, so on. Now things are getting windier. The snow is getting wetter. So we're having power outages. We're having trees flop over onto power lines, taken down the power line. The snow is heavier. It's, you know, it causes people to maintain their roofs a little more frequently and to clean the stuff off. So, um, yeah, have been changes. And also, I shared with you a study that showed how, because of all the increasing warmth in the Arctic, we're having rainy seasons extend further. And now the rain, as you know, they discussed at the top of this article, the rain contains a sensible heat, which helps melt the ice. Well, in here, if you have you know a snowless ground like we get in, in summer going into autumn, but you have rain falling, that rain penetrates the ground, percolates into the ground, that sensible heat is impacting the permafrost, helping to thaw it out, which then releases methane. So there is a lot of dynamics happening in the Arctic. And of course, what happens in the Arctic does not stay there. It impacts the rest of the planet. So while this is an important uh, new mechanism that's being quantified and is definitely impacting the sea ice, do not forget do what happens through Fran, what happens through the Bering, all that warm oceanic water containing all that increased oceanic heat content, which I have documented with you numer uh, several times now, the amount of heat that's in the oceans waiting to do something and that doing something i think helps drive these atmospheric rivers you know heat energy given off and it's going to make what looks like this year a really significant el nino event stay tuned for that one so anyway, another mechanism. These atmospheric rivers are impacting the sea ice. And that is due to the changing meridional uh, atmospheric flow patterns. And I think it's the, ocean, the heat content contained in the oceans that are helping to drive these rivers, especially in the Pacific, as Californians will attest to. So there you have it, folks. Thank you for your time. We'll talk soon.